Ancient Egyptian gods were extraterrestrials, according to leading QHHT practitioner. The evidence of ancient reptilian species walking and living among humanity spans multiple national cultures. Colonel Carl Nell on the reality of non-human intelligence visiting Earth and interacting with humanity. A forensic image expert has conducted a frame-by-frame -frame analysis of the 2023 Las Vegas alien sighting and concluded the tall beings are genuine. Total signatories to the Artemis Accords rises to 42, with Peru and Slovakia just joining. The first annual Space Piracy Conference, scheduled for February 2025, Congressman Robert Garcia is offering three UFO amendments to the National Defense Authorization Act for 2025. These stories are more on Exopolitics Today, the Week in Review. You are listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. This is the June 1st edition of Exopolitics Today, the Week in Review. So thank you for watching and a special shout out to everyone that has subscribed. Uh, we have uh, just achieved another milestone, 170,000 subscribers. So that's great. Appreciate you uh, recommending this channel to your friends and uh, relatives. So we're growing uh, really fast. So thank you. So let's begin with the first story I wanted to touch on for this week in review. And that is the interview I did uh, on Monday, May 27 with Suzanne Spooner, who has been conducting QHHT sessions uh, for over 13 years now. And she has accumulated quite an inventory of people sharing past life experiences with some fascinating insights into various ancient societies such as Egypt. And so in this uh, interview, we, we talk about a field trip that or a, a retreat that she did in Egypt that I was a part of. And uh, we got to tour a lot of very interesting sites. And she talked about some of the information she's received from people who have gone through the QHHT technique. Now, I, I think this technique is a, a valid source of information on what people have experienced in past lives. Now, I know for from a purely scientific perspective, that is a pretty controversial statement to make. But I, I consider QHT, uh, along with other kind of like non-conventional sources like remote viewing and channeling, uh, to be valid. Now, I, I think there is a screening process, a discernment process, because I don't think all QHHT practitioners are, are equal in terms of the output. Uh, same as not all channelers are, are good or equal in terms of their output, nor remote viewers. But I think when it comes to uh, people who do have a rigorous process and have a lot of experience, then we can get some uh, really good information. So I think Suzanne Spooner, because of her experience, definitely uh, qualifies. And so she has uh, given some really interesting feedback about the ancient Egyptian gods uh, being extraterrestrials. And uh, that is something that I am uh, very fascinated by. I mean, I'm going to be doing a, a webinar uh, coming up pretty soon, more about that uh, a little later in this week in review. And I also thought that what she was told about Donald Trump was very, very interesting that he is an ascended master playing the role of a systems buster or someone that's going to expose the system, despite, <coughs> pardon me, despite many personal character flaws. So I, I think uh, while uh, people can be all over the map concerning Donald Trump in, in terms of 
uh, his role in American politics, I think many people would probably agree uh, that he is a disrupting the system. And, and according to one of her sessions, she said that that is his role as this kind of ascended master in disguise uh, and, and that, yeah, the, the, the character flaws are, are really superficial that deep down he's playing this very important role to reveal to humanity the contradictions and the corruption in the system of governance. And you know, Trump is doing that uh, very much so, especially now with the uh, trial just in. I think a lot of people that maybe have been sitting on the fence on Trump are maybe now admitting finally saying, well, look, I mean, the, the Justice Department has is, has been is um, weaponizing the uh, legal system against Trump. Let's have a look at this. Uh, uh, this is the 25th anniversary of the 13th floor, which is a, a sci-fi movie. And it is something I remember seeing, oh, yeah, uh, close to 20 years ago. And, and it truly is... A, a very similar movie to The Matrix in terms of revealing the idea that we are living in a simulated reality, but it, uh, it does it in a in a way that I, I think is kind of like probably closer to the truth about the the simulation that we live in. So this is the 25th anniversary of the 13th floor. If you haven't seen it, seen it yet, it's a must see movie. Uh, very entertaining, and you will get a really good uh, idea of how the simulation hypothesis works. And uh, this is, I think, definitely worth considering in, in terms of what we are going through on this planet. Okay, so here's my webinar announcement. Uh, which is uh, for June 15, 2024, Ancient ET Gods Among Us Today. So here I'm going to be looking at what I found when I went to Egypt and in terms of the, the different hieroglyphs that I saw and the experiences I had there. And I'm going to be doing a review of some of the ancient texts concerning ancient ET gods, or ancient gods in Egypt, and finding the connection with extraterrestrial visitation. I think that's a very important point for us today because I, I don't think ancient Egyptian society, in terms of the extent to which extraterrestrial lived and walked amongst humanity, uh, is an ancient event that has no relevance to the present. I think that's the future we're going to. And so if that's the future we're going to, then I think it behooves us to learn as much as possible about ancient societies like Egypt where the extraterrestrials were living and walking amongst humanity. And also looking at whether or not the Egyptian gods are the same as the Anunnaki because that, I think, is a very important point. I mean, they were contemporary societies, so is it just the Egyptians had their own names for the Anunnaki? Or are we talking about two separate groups of extraterrestrials? So that's something I'm going to be addressing in the webinar. Okay, so here is a transcript of an interview of a 25-year CIA agent. Um, and this was an interview he did a couple of years ago about his contact with uh, manted ETs and tall greys. Now, the transcript is now available. So I think it's worthwhile taking a look at this particular individual's Jim Semivan, uh, look at his uh, testimony in terms of uh, these manted tall greys interacting with humanity. And, and I think it is very interesting that you, you're having more and more of these former intelligence operatives, people who have worked with the CIA or worked with the military intelligence community, coming forward saying, oh, we're contactees. Oh, you know, we have had 
first-hand experiences with uh, crash retrieval programs and so forth. And and I think at some point you have to ask yourself, well, are, are these truly former intelligence operatives? Uh, because I, I think you can be suspicious about this happening now. I mean, is it is it just fortuitous that these people are coming forward now? Or is this a means of being able to infiltrate the UFO disclosure community? Because uh, especially the mainstream media, I mean, they they will they will just flock. And of course, many of us who are researchers, I mean, we were very impressed by the credentials of people like Jim Semivan um, or or others who have similar. Uh, backgrounds, veterans with uh, d different intelligence agencies uh, because they look really good on paper. So we give them a lot of priority, uh, a lot of emphasis, but is the information clean? Is it loaded with disinformation? Is there an agenda there? Uh, these are all questions we need to ask ourselves. But uh, certainly uh, on the surface, I mean, here's someone who's had experiences with uh, non-human intelligence and is talking about it. So uh, 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 we can we can accept the testimony as, as genuine, whether or not there's an agenda, that's something we have to be very uh, wary of. Okay, so here is something posted by Jason Wilde and the Ubayyad figures from Iraq, so this is roughly 5,000 BC, uh, they show uh, what appears to be uh, reptilians. Now, I, I, I think I think these are the Anunnaki figures that he references, and he talks about Normali figures from Sierra Leone. So I believe these are the figures from Sierra Leone. And what they show is these reptilian beings. And I think this is just, you know, more examples or more evidence that we have this kind of a cross-cultural phenomenon where different societies talk about reptilians living and walking amongst humanity. So in addition to these examples, we, we have the Nagas in uh, India, Gargoyles in Britain, in Egypt, you you have Sobek, uh, the Egyptian crocodile god, uh, and and so forth across many cultures. So I think this is very important. We we need to consider that humanity is not the first species to walk this planet, and when it comes to the inner Earth, that there are remnants, I believe, of these prior surface civilizations. Some of them being reptilian that have escaped into the subterranean regions of the earth hundreds of thousands if not millions of years ago and that they are antecedent to humanity so that's a kind of big thing to consider that that we are not the first species on the surface of planet earth so we can't assume that the earth belongs to us okay so here is a a video clip from Carl Nell that talks about extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, non-human intelligence visiting the Earth and interacting with humanity. So I want to play that video for you. And uh, my last assignment uh, was involved with the UAP task force, which maybe is the most apropos uh, for this discussion. And, and so, Carl, here's, here's the million-dollar question. Do you believe that a higher form of non-human intelligence has visited this planet. Right. So non-human intelligence exists. Non-human intelligence has been interacting with humanity. This interaction is not new and it's been ongoing. And there are unelected people in the government that are aware of that. And, and so, Carl, that is quite a bold statement. Um, I'm wondering and I'm curious, how confident are you that that is true? There's zero doubt. Okay, so it's really refreshing to see uh, seeing a military officer being very clear in terms of the reality of non-human intelligence visiting the Earth and interacting with humanity. 
So I think the stage is set here for bombshell disclosures concerning extraterrestrials having met with uh, public government officials in the future. Now, that is something that I was talking about back in 2004, and, uh, yeah, and, and that actually led to my uh, sacking from American University, that I brought that up. And I was interviewed, and that interview uh, was covered in a story by the Washington Post called Ike and the Alien Ambassadors, and that was published on February 18, 2004. And so I made that point that uh, President Eisenhower, based on and it, or based on testimony of, of various uh, whistleblowers and insiders, had met with these extraterrestrials, and the university. Uh, just flipped out. They just were not happy with that, and I was sacked. I removed. So it's really nice to see that the groundwork has been laid by officers like uh, Colonel Carl Nell for uh, these kinds of official meetings being revealed in future disclosures. So that's that's good to see. Here's an interview I did with. James Gilliland, extraterrestrial contact in Washington and Hawaii. And so we just went over uh, James's extensive experience in uh, taking photographs and video of various spacecraft or various uh, UFOs that have appeared over his uh, ranch in Mount Adams, uh, Washington State, for close to 40 years now. And he's got thousands of videos and photos that he's taken and, and shared. It, Mount Adams is a special place. Uh, you have all kinds of contacts there, ascended masters, celestials, inner earth beings, uh, extraterrestrials, and, and many other entities have appeared before uh, the, the many thousands of people who have passed through uh, Mount Adams through his Aseti ranch there. So definitely someone with a, a lot of experience concerning extraterrestrial contact. Now, here is something that I thought was uh, quite a welcome development. Uh, so there's a, a forensic image expert who has conducted a frame-by-frame -frame analysis of the 2023 Las Vegas alien sighting and concluded that the tall beings are genuine. So this story, uh, here you have it, it appeared in the Gateway Pundit. So this is a crime scene analyst who says that two beings with cloaking devices are visible in Las Vegas video. So this is an expert who's appeared in um, many court cases as, as a photographic uh, video expert. And so he's conducted this frame-by-frame -frame analysis and he concludes that this video taken of these eight foot tall beings in the back of a home of a Las Vegas residence where a UFO was seen by hundreds of people landing that there was an eight foot nine foot tall being or two two of them there so this is kind of my more confirmation that something really did happen with that Las Vegas incident All right, so here's an announcement. Uh, only weeks to go. Well, actually, there's uh, this the Galactic Spiritual Informers Connection Conference is going to be held in September. Uh, let me, uh, September 27 to 29. And uh, it is going to be a blockbuster conference with lots of great speakers, uh, yours truly among them. Um, and, and we're going to have uh, many. Uh, topics, esoteric topics, contact topics addressed. Uh, Leonard Danan will be speaking. Uh, you you have uh, Dr. Christiane Northrup, Tony Rodriguez, Nikki Allen was there last year, Jean-Charles Moyen, I've interviewed him many times, Dan Willis also, Melanie Charest, uh, contactee, Jerry Willis, another contactee, Dan, Will uh, Dan Winter, a, um, a, a scientist, uh, Dr. Lee Merritt, a health 
practitioner expert Danny Henderson is also a contactee and, and of course, the organiser. And David Adair, he is also going to be present. I don't know if he's going to be physically there because his health is not so good, but uh, he's, uh, I believe, has committed to doing at least a Zoom call, Zoom event. And also, I'm, uh, it's, uh, I'm happy to uh, announce that JP will also be present and will be doing uh, a presentation um, at this conference. Now, because of uh, JP's military uh, career and developments there, we're not quite sure yet if it's going to be done via Zoom or whether he will just be up on the stage or join me up on stage. We will let you, we'll let you know a little closer to the event, but JP definitely uh, will be physically present even though he might not. Well, we'll see whether he can actually... Uh, present live on the stage or he, he has to do it through Zoom, through a hotel room to maintain anonymity. But uh, more on that soon. Well, here's um, an important development. Uh, the number of signatories to the Artemis Accords has risen to 42, with Peru and Slovakia joining. So the, the Artemis Accords are the civilian side of an emerging US-led civilian military alliance that makes up our Star Trek future. Uh, the Star Trek future is something that uh, you, the United States Space Force is actively trying to establish by the year 2060. That is actually part of the goals that the Space Force inherited from its predecessor, which is US uh, Air Force Space Command, uh, which in 2019, just a few months before the actual inauguration of Space Force, had a, a Space Futures workshop where the consensus was that the optimal future scenario for the United States, out of a choice of eight possible scenarios, the optimal scenario was a Star Trek future. So that is actually part of the Space Force's uh, history and what they're aiming for. And, and I think we are seeing that unfold before our eyes, 42 nations who, that have space programs or have aspirations to have a presence in space in terms of companies or sending astronauts up there or to be part of scientific missions in space, they are already part of the Artemis Accords, they've signed on. Whereas there is a rival space alliance, uh, which is led by China and Russia, and that has currently 11 signatories to it, but the only major space powers with it are China and Russia. And Russia's presence with that alliance is really contingent on uh, the US and NASA and other European nations kind of like playing hardball with Russia due to Ukraine. But once the Ukraine crisis is resolved, I, I, I don't think there's going to be much doubt that Russia will realign and start working with the Artemis Accords. I mean, because Russia is a signatory to, to the International Space Station, while China isn't. China is precluded from that. And, and, it's, and there's many reasons why China has been excluded from the International Space Station program. And, and that has to do with intellectual uh, property theft and, and China uh, taking advantage of um, um, industrial espionage to really steal and uh, reverse engineer a, a lot of uh, Western technologies without giving anything in return. Okay, so here is a conference that is going to be organized in uh, 2025. So this is going to be the first annual space piracy conference. So, yep, you heard it. Uh, you heard correctly, space piracy. That is an issue. Even though for those that uh, proposing the conference, they're proposing it as a theoretical issue because, you know, clearly commerce and so forth is yet to take off in in space according to the conventional science 
or the, the, the conventional worldview. But we know, those of you that have been uh, following my work and have copies of my Secret Space Program book series, nine books um, in total, that there is there are rogue elements in space. Uh, and these include a, a German dark fleet, the Nachtwaffen, as some people refer to it. Uh, there's a CIA National Reconnaissance Office space program, which is also rogue. There are corporate secret space programs, and, and they also can, can be considered rogue. And then, of course, you have the national or you have the military space programs of the of the uh, Space Force, of uh, the, the US Navy, but they can't be considered rogue because they are being slowly integrated and absorbed into the architecture being set up for this Star Trek future. And that Star Trek future, as I mentioned, is being created. So the military aspects or the military space assets that belong to these secret space programs will be absorbed into what will be a future Starfleet. Uh, but those rogue elements, those elements that are not part of this process, uh, and they include the Dark Fleet, they include the CIA NRO space program, uh, and, and corporate secret space programs, that they could at any time play the role of um, pirates. Uh, they, they have their own objectives, they have their own activities, their own fleets. It's all done covertly and at any time they can conduct space piracy as a cover for some illicit activity or some, some program. But uh, yeah, so I don't know if the people organizing this uh, conference would be ready to hear that kind of information. Uh, but certainly we know that that is a very real problem. And, and that's not even considering extraterrestrials, that ex extraterrestrials, uh, rogue extraterrestrial groups uh, that might still be operating in our solar system. Okay, so here's the last story I wanted to cover for the week in review. The Congressman Robert Garcia is offering three UFO amendments to the National Defense Authorization Act for 2025. So that's that's the Authorization Act that spells out the different programs that will be part of the Pentagon that require funding. So he's offering these UFO amendments or UAP amendments. And one of those, well, let's see what, what he says. Uh, he says here, uh, my first amendment creates a UAP reporting mechanism for civilian pilots. So that is something that um, there's an organization set up by a former US Navy uh, witness, uh, Ryan Graves, who was part of the congressional hearing in July of 2023, uh, where he was, he's part of an, an organization that he founded to set up this reporting mechanism for civilian pilots. And, and that's certainly a, a welcome development. You, you need to have something that pilots can report to without being ostracized or punished, which has been the case for, uh, for, for, for many years now. His second amendment, amendment includes a UAP disclosure provisions from last year that were blocked, including a UAP re records review board. So this is, this is really the important amendment or the important uh, piece of legislature uh, legislation which is being proposed, that this UAP Records Review Board, it, it would have the power of subpoena, the uh, eminent domain. So he really is re resurrecting this in the, this re review board that would comprise nine individuals that would report directly to the US president. Currently, uh, you, you have the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, which is embedded within the Pentagon, and it reports to an undersecretary within the Pentagon um, and or to the deputy director or, or the deputy secretary of the, of, the, of the Pentagon. Well, those officials can at any time block information if they feel that somehow uh, it doesn't mesh with Pentagon interests, 
whereas the president could, well, in theory, be the individual that is most insistent on transparency and releasing and disclosing information because I think that would be something that would help their their record and uh, I think transparency is something that all presidents support because it obviously translates into positive poll numbers. So this is a very important uh, provision. Now, the power of subpoena and eminent domain, that's very important because at the end of the day, uh, the success of any institution, you know, whether we're talking about the Arrow Office, uh, whether we're talking about a a review, a records review board, it's going to be their ability to be able to pressure um, in other government agencies or military departments or corporations, most importantly, to pressure them into releasing any UFO-related information that they have. So the power of subpoena is important, as is the power of eminent domain, because a lot of these technologies were handed over to corporations uh, for study and reverse engineering. And so that means that if you want to know exactly what has been recovered and what progress has been made in reverse engineering that, that you need to be able to gain access. So these powers, subpoena, uh, eminent domain, are very important to the success of a records review board. Uh, so the final amendment, ensures that Arrow has access to uh, covert intelligence for investigations because, as I said, uh, the Arrow office has been denied access because it lacks these powers of subpoena, eminent domain, and and so forth. So uh, certainly there have been a number of developments this week. Uh, I, I think we are going into a hot summer more and more developments are, are going to emerge. Uh, we'll see how far this um, NDAA Act for 2025 goes in terms of incorporating some of these um, amendments. Uh, that'll be very interesting to see. And I look forward to uh, keeping uh, up to date with uh, the, the latest ExoPolitics news and relaying that to you over the next week. So thank you for watching and subscribing to Exit Politics today. I really appreciate it. Aloha. You have been listening to Exit Politics today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com.